great to see so many people here. Um, so my name's Andy, I'm uh, a PM in the uh, Azure Core Linux team, part of the crew at Microsoft helping uh, to improve Linux in Azure and also Linux, Linux more generally as well, because um, we're investing a lot in the broader Linux and open source communities. And um, one of the things we do as part of that is actually invest in a container Linux distro called Flatcar, which is a continuation of, um, of the original core OS container Linux. And so I want to share with you just some things we're working on in that project, which I think are quite interesting more generally for how distros might look in the future, um, building on, uh, on some, some of the recent work that's been happening in the Systemd project. Uh, so but before we dive into that, um, you know, what comes to mind when you, if you just think about Linux distro, right? Think about what the concept of Linux distro, what are you thinking of? And probably my guess is you just think there are loads of them. There are so many Linux distros, right? And, um, you know, there are things that certain, certain of them have in common. Some of them are community driven. Some of them are more enterprise focused. Um, for the purpose of this talk, what we're going to talk about is more kind of the distinction between what I call a general purpose Linux and a container optimized or special purpose um, Linux. And, you know, I, I think it's, it's important. I mean, one of the things we love in the Linux community is choice, right? Um, so we love to have all these options. Um, and one of, one of the characteristics of having all of this choice is there's, there's no one solution there that's perfect for every use case. Um, and so let's think about some of the trade-offs, particularly with just when we think about general purpose versus um, special purpose. So what does a general purpose uh, Linux look like? Basically, it's a, um, you know, it, it's a stack starting from um, a, you know, an immutable file system, which the, the sorry, an immutable file system, uh, which has the kernel, typically, a, you know, some kind of uh, init system, typically system D today, and, um, you know, and, and running on top of that, a whole set of packages and your workloads run on that. And there may be, you know, thousands of packages installed by default, probably tens of thousands in the broader universe of packages that the distro maintains and makes available. Right, so, so that's typically what you're thinking about this. And a lot of great aspects to this, right? So it's very, very flexible. So probably any application you want to deploy, you can find the right packages, you can uh, make it work for your use case. Um, but there are some things that come with that, right? As they say, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, with a great number of packages comes a great number of vulnerabilities. Um, and some of them actually exploit the nature of the operating system. So this CVE here, for example, is actually exploiting the fact that this underlying file system is mutable. So it's changing the operating system files un, you know, underneath the covers to get a vulnerability right there into the, into the OS. And um, you know, the, the sheer volume of these things and the rate that they're increasing these vulnerabilities means it's really hard if you're in charge of deploying a fleet of these machines, it doesn't matter which distro, a general purpose Linux distro across a large number of machines, then keeping up with all of those vulnerabilities and managing that is, is a full-time job for you know, maybe many people. Um, so you know, these vulnerabilities is, is, is one issue, just the fact that you have this very large attack surface area, but the fact also that you can go into an individual machine, SSH into it, deploy a new package, change the configuration. Each of these machines can end up being a little bit of a snowflake uh, and you get this you know, configuration drift and all of the pro manageability problems that we're familiar with in um, managing large fleets of Linux machines. And there are tools for addressing some of these things, but fundamentally it's, they're all remediating something which is a characteristic of the operating system. Um, so, so that's great. So, how do we think about a special purpose operating system though? So probably CoreOS was the, you know, the original and, and still maybe the, the best known, but there's a bunch of these out there now. Uh, and they typically work on the, on the concept of there being an immutable uh, file system. So the operating system files that are deployed on that machine are never gonna change. And we'll come to kind of the question of updates and things like that later. Um, you've got a pretty small collection of packages. So maybe only tens or low hundreds of packages that are deployed into this machine. 
and um, you, anything you, you need extra in terms of your workloads are actually going to be bundled into the container. And this was kind of the realization why we came to this point was because people were bundling everything into the container, and then you're saying, well, why do I need the things in the operating system? All right, so this has a lot of great advantages, and there's reasons why people have adopted these for certain use cases, right? So you've reduced your attack surface area to the absolute minimum, including making that uh, underlying file system immutable. Uh, it's manageable at scale. You get repeatable deployments because every machine is deployed the same because it comes from a declarative config, right? But not everything's perfect here either, right? If I'm uh, looking for a package which isn't in that very small set of packages, how do I get it? Right, if I want a, a different container runtime, it's probably an opinionated distro. For example, with Flatcar, we ship container D. Right, well, what if I want Podman? What if I want Cryo? What if I want um, you know, a whole number of other packages? How am I gonna deploy that? Um, you know, so maybe I submit, a p submit a, an issue to the project and say, hey, can you add this package for me, please? Well, the concept of this distro is to be minimal. So you're not gonna get a package added in just for your one use case. So now that, okay, so you've got an SDK, I can go build, build a version of it with my package in. Great, congratulations, you've just become a distro maintainer. Right, so like, this isn't, as a user, this isn't an optimal state of affairs if the specific use cases that that distro is designed for are not exactly the ones that you want to use it for. So um, how do we resolve this? Because, um, uh, you know, because it, it, it really is, you need, advanced knowledge to get kind of beyond this, this point. You know, what I'd like, right? So dream scenario, right? I would, I would like to be able to start from a, a, this immutable base and then layer on layers of packages with whatever I want to bring in, right? Um, just like so many pancakes, because who doesn't like pancakes? I like pancakes. Uh, and I'm not talking about like an traditional OS package manager, because you might say, well, we have that already, we have package managers. I'm not thinking of that, I'm thinking more of like keeping these advantages of a special purpose OS, but making it composable, right? So um, you get all of those advantages, but you get that flexibility, and maybe you get some maple syrup with it as well. Um, so what does that look like? Well, so I'm, I'm starting with my beautiful file system, just the same as today. I've got my kernel, I've got the system D, but then I've got these extension layers, which at boot time I'm, I'm loading on and I'm actually building a composed file system as I go along. And then, of course, you still have your workloads that you're gonna run as uh, containers or as WebAssembly modules or, or whatever, um, kind of depending on how you've built that system. So, um, you know, these, these layers that we're talking about, you know, actually uh, what we call system extensions. And that's, that's where we get into leveraging some of the work that's come out of the System D project over the last couple of years. So, as you can see, if we can do this, then we get all the advantages of a general purpose OS, and it's kind of a best of both worlds story, and the, the um, advantages of the, um, of, the, of the container or special purpose Linux as well. So, what is a system extension? What does that actually look like? Because um, in some ways you can think of it as a bit like a container, but it's, it's got a, it's, its own uh, special way that it's, it's built. So the first thing is you're only putting files, it's, it's, a, it's an extension of the system, so it's going into your system, um, system directories into user and uh, slash opt, and you're building a, an overlay file system. Right now how this is done is when, you, when it goes on, it's, it makes it immutable. So even if you're building on, it onto an immutable system, uh, it makes the whole thing immutable. Um, so you take those, um, you take those uh, files along uh, and they get, it's packaged as a disk image. So when you're pulling it, it's a, it's a raw disk image typically. And there's this tool called uh, systemd sysext, which again, typically you're loading at boot time. You can actually load at runtime as well. Um, but th th there's kind of nuances we get in, can get into there. But think of it as, uh, this uh, disk image, which you're loading um, at boot time. Now, um, so I said with this is something we've been embracing in the flat car project. We've actually had three key things we've been trying to work on where we've used this concept and it's been really useful for us. Um, so I wanted to just share that so you can kind of see 
maybe some of the areas where, um, where we've seen applicability. So the first is replacing uh, this old tool that's been around for a long time in CoreOS since the very early days of CoreOS called Talks. And this, this was a, um, a, a tool which was trying to solve this problem of how do I deploy additional container runtimes. And it was kind of a, a complex and inflexible and uh, a very much a kind of a point solution to this particular problem and had all sorts of um, challenges with it, which meant it really didn't get used very often. So what we've done is we've, we actually moved the um, container D runtime out into its own sysext. And so from a user's perspective, it doesn't change the behavior at all. They boot up flat card by default, it comes with container D just as they're used to. But in practice, it's actually deployed as a sysex. And if they want to switch in uh, you know, Podman or um, Docker or di different um, runtimes, they can do that, uh, have them as well as or instead of. Instead of. And, uh, and so that's, that's uh, uh, something that users have really um, embraced. And we've seen people adding their own new runtimes and, and making contributions to the project that way. Um, the next thing that was a, a big issue for us was uh, because we ship for all sorts of different platforms, every cloud provider, every, uh, you know, every, every kind of platform you can imagine, virtualization, QMU, all of these things, and a lot of them require platform-specific tools. So for example, with VMware, you have uh, the open uh, VMware tools. With Azure, you have the Azure Linux agent, et cetera, right? So um, the way CoreOS had solved this was they had a partition called the OEM partition, which had those agents and tools deployed uh, into it. And um, the, the challenge with that was because it wasn't delivered as part of the core uh, OS partition, when you did OS upgrades, this didn't get up updated. And there was no mechanism in place for updating this other than completely wiping the machine and, you know, and repaving. So, um, so that was a, the, the kind of the challenge that we had. And where we went with that was we said, okay, we're gonna make, make these tools available as SysX as well. Right, so we've got one for each platform. It's, it's also, the nice thing here is this is now consistent with how we do the container runtime as well. Right, so it's, you've got one way of extending the system and we now can do in-place upgrades. The, the last application is an interesting one as well because I think it has application beyond, quite, quite broadly beyond Flatcar. Um, and for those of you who know Kubernetes um, cluster API, so it's a, it's a mechanism for provisioning Kubernetes uh, nodes and clusters. And one of the things you have to provide cluster API is a, a node image. Now, it, there's tools as part of the cluster, cluster API project based, built on Packer to bake, essentially, a Kubernetes and OS distro into, into a single image, which gets deployed out. So, um, but cluster API has no concept of in-place updates. Uh, and you've got the, 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 because your Kubernetes and OS image are tied, there is no way of updating them independently, uh, which you know, is, th they're on completely separate release streams. You, there is no logical reason why they should be tied together apart from the inflexibilities of cluster API architecture, right? So what we did here was uh, actually used uh, system extensions to build a C Kubernetes control plane system extension. So when you want that worker node, it's a stock flat car image. So what you're giving cluster API is a stock flat car image, but you're just giving it some configuration parameters that say load the sysx on for the, for the Kubernetes control plane. So you're not building a special image just for this one application. And now I can do in-place updates on separate tr tracks for the OS and for the, um, and for the control plane. So this is something cluster API community is pretty, um, pretty excited about. Okay, so, does this sound like a good idea? Uh, sound interesting? Good, you wanna go make one? Uh, how do you do that? So, uh, we have, um, uh, we have, we have a, a part of the uh, Flatcar uh, repo called SysX Bakery, so you can go there and check out a lot of recipes and uh, it'll, it'll explain a bit about how you go about making your own SysX. So you, um, you start with which files is it you want to bake into this uh, sysext, there's some config, there's some metadata which goes with it. Um, so it's, that's pretty straightforward to then, um, uh, we have a, a script called bake, which then turns that into a sysext image. Um, 
So there's, it does simplify the process, but there's, in full transparency, what we're talking about here is still pretty raw, sorry for the pun, uh, but it's raw in terms of the user experience. So there's a lot of different places you've got to go tweak things and, uh, you know, it's a shell script. It's not a nice simple command with uh, parameters. And, uh, you know, it's, I, I think that, the, you know, this is one area where we, we have room to, um, you know, work with the community to build a, a better experience. But it might, it might help to think of this in terms of analogy and in terms of the user experience we want to get to. So think of, you know, this, what you're putting in the front end here, it's kind of like a Docker file, right? And what you're doing here, it's kind of like Docker build, and this output is kind of like your Docker container image, right? So if we take that analogy forward, um, you know, how do we then publish this? Uh, so what we've got to do right now is we create a checksum, which is, includes the index of all of the, um, all of the sysx raw files that you, you want to publish in a given place. Uh, there's um, an, an optional uh, configuration file which describes the policies for updating this sysx. And you're going to put both of those in, uh, along with the sysx image, uh, uh, to some HTTP endpoint, doesn't, or HTTPS endpoint. And doesn't really matter where, but like the obvious and easy one is to just drop it into GitHub. You've got your build process. It's probably dropping artifacts somewhere. And so that's actually what we do is, um, uh, you know, with, with Flatcar built into sysx. And, you know, you can kind of think of that as your Docker push. But again, user experience needs, some, needs a little bit of uh, sugar around it, but I think it's uh, you can kind of see where this is where this is going um, So there are a bunch of um, A bunch of sysx up in the flat car repo already so you can go and try out So I mentioned kind of docker compose the, the kubernetes one is we use for cluster API uh, There's a few uh, wasm uh, ones. We'll talk about wasm a little bit later uh, Some PRs in progress for other things. So there's some some things you can go and use off the shelf so how do I use them? <laughs> so before we go into how do you consume them, uh, we're going to need to do a little bit of a detour into how you actually configure and provision flat car in general. Um, so, so what we start with, so the first thing to understand is it's, it's a declarative config. So um, you're not going in and tweaking a lot of things. You have a, a config file which describes the state of each node. And you know, typically, this is going to be provisioning thousands of nodes that are all going to get the same config file. Um, so there's a human read readable, depending on your definition of YAML, if you consider that human readable. But um, we, we do, for the, for the sake of argument, accept that YAML is human readable. Uh, that runs through a transpiler and converts it into a machine readable config, uh, which, is, uh, which is then passed into the OS uh, at, boot, at boot time the ignition process within uh, the flat car boot um, sequence reads that, applies uh, the config, uh, passes some things onto system D. So if you need system, uh, system D services, then uh, that goes into system D. And um, uh, in a, you can think of this as a bit like cloud init. Um, and in fact, we don't have cloud init within flat car and you typically don't in these kind of OSs. Um, so this is where we want to get the um, the config in, so we basically want to put in the butane config. Here is the sysx I want to have in this um, uh, in this instance of flat car. So this is what that looks like. It's it's actually pretty simple, right? So you've just got um, got a definition of where the files are, where they're located, and also where to set up um, symlinks. Which and actually that's I mean the symlinks piece is optional, but you probably want to do this to facilitate updates later and. So let's talk about updates, because that is the next thing. Um, and updates is where it gets a little bit, um, uh, you, you need to think a little bit about the specific kind of sysx that you've got, right? So I think of them in kind of three categories. There's ones which are completely operating system independent. So this might just be, I need some other package which doesn't have any, any hard dependencies on particular library versions or particular kernel version or anything like that. Um, and this is probably the majority of cases, right? This is where user says, oh, I just need this extra package in it. Great, go build one of these sysx, right? So, um, so this is where that update config uh, file comes in. And um, that, uh, that's, that's basically passed into um, systemd sysupdate. And 
uh, systemd sysupdate, it just does a, on a polling basis, so you say how frequently you want it to poll, and it go, go and poll the HTTPS endpoint, and does a pretty simple semver check, and if there's a new version, it'll download it and install it, and that config file will say how to install it, whether you want it to be applied straight away, whether you want it to wait, whether you, want it, whether you have, um, you know, the commands you want to execute before you apply the update, whether it requires a reboot or a, a refresh. So um, that's kind of the standard, uh, an easy way to, to do those things. And then there's what I call OS dependent sysx, where there's a tighter link between the sysx. It's still shipped separate from the OS image, right? But it's, um, it, for some dependency reason with the OS, it needs to be shipped in lockstep with the, uh, with the OS. And what we do here, and so an example of this might be the, those OEM tools that I talked about. Actually, this is why we developed this, because we wanted to have control over the, um, like the, the Azure Linux agent that got deployed along with, uh, with the flat car image. Um, so here, we just basically piggybacked on top of the existing OS update mechanism, so extended the update server protocol that we have for flat car to basically say also, in addition to any OS images, have you got any new sysx for me? Right, so the, so the existing flat car server update infrastructure could serve these uh, sysx down to, um, to those nodes. Um, so that, that's a um, kind of nice way of, of delivering those. And then thirdly is ones where it's actually baked into the OS, right? So um, you have uh, the OS image, which actually includes a sysx, and it's not going to go and pull it from an HTTP endpoint. It's just part of the image. And there, that's just coming in with your regular OS image, the same as any packages. Um, so those are the three ways of doing it. And if we go back and look at that ignition config, right, these are, um, this is what you need to add into that. So f as an example, the example here is the using a, uh, installing the wasm time um, sysx, right, so we're adding in um, the a pointer to that update. See, the wasmtime.conf is, so that's the path to the actual um, update uh, configuration file. Um, and then under system D, so this is, this is what gets passed by ignition to system D to say, here, please, uh, please, um, you know, start these units at, uh, at boot time. And see, so there's a couple of system D, uh, services you need to start. One is the sys update timer and the, and the other is the actual sys update piece. So, um, to do the polling and then you say, here's the endpoint to go poll, um, to ask for, uh, for the new, f uh, sysx file. And then here's the, here's the policy on uh, the up, updates and which, so here, you know, it's going to do a restart of, um, it's going to require a restart of the system DSSX um, uh, service at the point that that does that update. So what if I've, so I've got, I've got my SysX and I've baked it and it's all great and it's working, but now I'm running an enterprise with 10,000 nodes and I want to just be able to ship an image out to all of my users and say, here, go deploy this. And maybe it's air-gapped, right? So I, I can't go pull down this, um, the, the sysx app provisioning time from an HTTPS endpoint, but I do have the image, right? So, um, so we've actually uh, built a script here to make it easy for you to create a new whole OS image that includes that, um, uh, that sysx. So you've got your sysx, so you can see the command here is just, you know, but bake the image, um, and, uh, you know, here's for this vendor and here's this, here's the sysx that you want to embed in it and it outputs a, a, a new, um, image including that sysx. So it just kind of makes it, um, simplifies the deployment a little bit in, in those scenarios. And, um, so we've talked about a couple of, or in the examples here, I've, I've talked about wasm cloud there, I've talked about wasm time, um, but we haven't really talked about WebAssembly much yet. Uh, and I think this, you know, this is a, going to be a big driver for this going forward. It's going to be um, b because this is such a, WebAssembly is such a fast-moving space. People are going to want to combine and, and uh, play with different tools, and they're going to want a similar kind of experience to the container Linux experience, right? But instead of container runtimes, they're going to want WebAssembly runtimes. Because um, so, quick uh, step back, and maybe I've gone a little bit too far in that, but like. W WASM is, is WebAssembly, same thing. Um, you know, so it's basically uh, like containers, it's code that runs in a, in a sandbox, but it's a much more secure sandbox than, than a container sandbox. Um, it, you can, 
it, it's a, a runtime like a, you know, like a Java uh, bytecode, but most languages compile to it. Um, runs across architectures, so uh, this is a really useful environment. So, for example, when if you deploy Kubernetes today, you have some Windows nodes, some ARM, ARM Linux nodes, some x86 Linux nodes. You need different container images for each of those environments. With uh, WASM modules, and modules is what they're, they're called, right? You just have a single module that runs across all of those environments, and you know, characteristically, they're very small, they're very fast, very efficient, um, often used for kind of edge applications, right? So you're going to need a WASM, WASM runtime and maybe debugging tools and observability tools and things like that for the Linux OS that you want to deploy these on, all right? So, um, so hence, concept of a WASM optimized Linux, right? So if we can have container optimized Linux, let's have a WASM optimized Linux. Similar kind of thing. I'm going to build an immutable file system. I'm going to need my kernel and system D. But now, instead of having container runtimes, I've got WebAssembly runtimes. And another nice thing here is you notice I don't say anything about having container D or Docker running here, right? Even though that's kind of a base capability in, in Flatcar, because it's delivered as a sysext, I can just easily disable that, and then I don't even have the container runtimes um, present in the system. It's not even just they're not running, those files are not there, which often when you're talking about you know, compliance um, requirements, that might be something that's important. Okay, so let's look at that, uh, that WASM landscape, right? There are, uh, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a WebAssembly expert, but I know there's a lot of projects out there. Um, I see people, um, you know, that there's new, new projects all the time. We were just at uh, KubeCon, SpinCube was announced. Um, but we've got a couple of these which are already in the main upstream flat car um, repository. So you can just pull those down from, um, uh, from the flat car Sysx bakery. Uh, there's also a colleague of mine called Ralph Squalache who is very active in this space and he has built a bunch of these Sysx. So he has a fork of the Sysx Bakery, if you want to go play with them, like all of those other projects have Sysx for them as well. Um, so, you know, we'll, over time, we'll probably move some of these into, into upstream. Um, but, uh, you know, for, for now, this is a very fast moving space and we'll kind of see, uh, see what we bring in upstream. So, um, so that, that's really kind of the takeaways here, right, is system D, and, and specifically the systemd sysx capability. Um, it's, not, it's not that old now. It's maybe kind of three or four years since that first came out. Um, not that well known by a lot of people, uh, but we're pretty excited about it for what it is going to enable. And I think this has that pretty broad applications. Um, I should have mentioned there's also a, um, a kind of a, a parallel project to that or parallel command system, um, systemd uh, confxt where It'll actually do a similar kind of overlay um, mechanism for uh, system configuration files, so for, X, um, for uh, ETC. So that's, you know, we think that's pretty promising. Uh, it gives you kind of a best of both worlds of the immutability of a container Linux with the flexibility of a general purpose Linux. And, you know, in the, uh, in the flat car project, we've, been, we've embraced it. We've been very happy with the results that we've got from it, what it's simplified for us. Um, so we have a, you know, we have a pretty small team. So having things that actually simplify our lives is, is a good thing. Um, you know, and we think it actually extends the applicability of what we're doing into applications like, uh, like WebAssembly. So, but that's a lot of words, you know, if you're, you know, if you're uh, a little bit younger than me, then, you know, maybe that's your, key, that's your key takeaway, right? Um, so, uh, so I like the meme, um, but, um, more importantly, if, uh, if it sounds interesting and you think, hey, I want, I want to get involved in this because this might be uh, something that's applicable to things I'm working on, there's actually uh, several groups working on all of this underlying technology. So there's a, a group called the Linux User Space API group where pretty much every Linux vendor, I think, is participating in that. It's not huge, so you know, it's only a, a small number from each of the, each of the vendors. But it's, it's really the people that are, are really thinking about these, um, these kind of challenges. And there's probably an annual meeting uh, that they're having. That's kind of the cadence right now. And some, offline, uh, you know, some async stuff as well. So if you go to that URL, you can see that. 
Also within the, uh, within the CNCF, we actually established recently a, group, a special interest group called, called the Special Purpose uh, OS Working Group. Um, so under the runtime um, technical advisory group, so all of these uh, hierarchies of different groups, but um, that's, that's kind of a talking shop for uh, all of the container Linux kind of distros. So um, if that world's interesting, please do join that. They have regular um, meetings. Um, and then within the flat car project, uh, you can, obviously everything there is open. It's actually uh, going into CNCF. Uh, we're going through the process of um, getting that into CNCF. We're pretty close to that now. Uh, and um, we have monthly office hours and you know, happy for people to come and the, the engineering team is on, the, on those calls and uh, really happy to engage in, um, in collaboration. So, you know, I'd, I'd really, you know, I think the, the thing here is if, if I haven't said, <laughs> said it already, right, we, we are building on the shoulders of giants. I mean, all of the time within the open source world, we're building on the, source, on the shoulders of giants. But this is something where I think, you know, we can actually doing that build on, you know, build the next generation of Linux distros for the next generation of Linux workloads. So that's it. I'm going to wrap up there and I have a few minutes for questions. Thank you. Centil. Oh, didn't know that you knew me, but. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Systemd already had a construct called portable image format. It seems fairly similar. Was was this an extension of that particular concept? Uh, and did that previous concept fail in certain ways for this to be? So I don't I, I don't know about like the where that ended up, but I think a key difference here is this update mechanism, right? So so and the uh, you know pulling at runtime and being able to apply apply, you know, compose the file system at runtime and then have all of the update kind of semantics around it. So I th that, so I, I, th I think it's quite a long way further on whether or not it was actually derived or it's just kind of, you know, forked off at some point. I'm, I'm not sure. So, um Larry Carvalho with Robust Cloud. Where would you see this Linux con with Wasm going? Would it be on the edge? Would it be on the browser? Would it be all of the above? You know, and what is going to be the overall value? Is it mostly on security or beyond security on this uh, on the you know adoption of Wasm in Linux? Yeah. Um, so, a great question because I did I didn't clarify with WebAssembly, right? So one of the so WebAssembly originated, as you can tell in the name, in the browser. It was originally a web technology. And in the browser, you know, the browser is the operating environment for that. So the browsers include the runtime. Um, what we're talking about here is server side applications of WebAssembly, where you're actually wanting to deploy uh, WASM modules for you know, edge processing of you know, web requests or things like that, right? So, um, so I, I see it basically enabling security and manageability at scale um, for, for WASM environments. What are some of the advantages of SysExt over uh, OS tree? Um, yeah, so that's, uh, so OS tree's trying to build some, uh, you know, it, it's kind of similar. I would, I would say um, the, where we want to get to with this is a much simpler user experience. Um, and for it to be, so with OS tree, I th you know, it's closer to being in the, in the game of actually building your own distro, I think, and it's closer to kind of package management. Um, but you're right, I mean, this, they're kind of solving um, similar problems, but we're, uh, uh, yeah, um, I'm not sure if I have a better <laughs> kind of pros and cons lined, lined up there. So. Uh, can you help me understand the kind of fall on the kind of system package versus the system extensions? It's so like for Flatcar, you've chosen to have immutable file system and do things through system extensions, but that's 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 the Flatcar choice, right? You could have package management and system extensions. It's just then then you're they're kind of battling each other for what's the latest OS. 
user space runtimes? Y yeah. Um, I mean, so there's a there's a philosophical choice with um, you know with container Linuxes not to do package management because um, you know because of the kind of the snowflake aspect of it and it tends to be kind of brittle and um, so it's a it's a way of enabling that flexibility without having to bring in all of the all of the complexity of package management so uh, but yeah if you have package management then this probably doesn't you know, it doesn't buy you a lot if, because that's the way you're going to be deploying additional software onto onto each node. I will. Oh, sorry. On the on the question about RPM OS tree, I'd, I will say there was uh, there there is a distro, and I I forget which one it is now. I'm not going to say it because in case I'm wrong. Uh, but there is one that's actually switched from using RPM OS tree to using uh, Sysx for distribution recently. And if you want to follow up offline, I can find find pointers to that. Um, I was a few minutes late, so hopefully you didn't already cover this. But you were talking about with um, uh, Sysx sort of the the runtime update capability, and talked a little bit about running in, in Kubernetes clusters. And I wonder how. How you how is that handling kind of like a bulk upload of 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 nodes or containers running on those in terms of like if restarts are required or if there's caches that need to be reflushed or getting the right you know bits back up into memory? Yeah. Are there any mechanisms in place for that that are provided, or is that something you'd be rolling on your own? So, great question, and that is that definitely falls into the category of things that we want to improve the UX of, right? So one of the things that we have with Flatcar for OS image updates is it's, it's got a fairly uh, a fairly basic um, update protocol in terms of what's implemented on the client. But uh, so it uses the Omaha protocol, which is the same that Chrome, you know, came from Chrome OS. Um, but on the server, we have all sorts of um, uh, cont policy controls that lim you know, li limit, so you can say have, you know, at most n machines doing an update at any one time. If you hit, if you hit an error which forces a rollback, then s stop the rollout of the new version. You know, canary nodes, all of that kind of stuff, right? With Sysx, the Sys system D um, Sys update is pretty rudimentary right now. I mean, it's literally just each node on its own, on a on a pole, going and checking a server, and if it's there, it updates it. So, yeah, we one of one of the things we want to to do is actually maybe bring some of those concepts that we have from the flat car update uh, and provide more sophisticated options for, for how updates get deployed for system extensions as well. Um, so, and, and that's one of the, one of the things that we, we do with the, the middle option for um, updating that I talked about where we've integrated, uh, it's essentially a replacement for, this, for the sys update. Um, it's integrated into our flat car update protocol, but that's flat car specific and, it, and we'd like to kind of bring that capability into generic sys updates. So I think we've got time for one more. I have a follow-up if no one has. Yeah. <laughs> Don't see any other hands. Uh, um, then, and so then um, I guess my follow-up question is then if I'm sort of running a more like, uh, I'm going to say uh, traditional sort of like uh, containerized workload, and I need things like you know uh, um, rollback, and I need things like uh, blue green kind of or deployments or some progressive deployment or something like that. Um, is there? I mean, is there an advantage right now in using it or even sort of embarking on a sort of solution like this for like your more traditional kind of clustered service microservices? Other than maybe like it sounds like space saving could be one in terms of the container size. So maybe there's a, a cost advantage in that capacity. But I'm curious if there's a, if there's something. Um, in those workloads where like maybe you're hoping to get to or there's things you could take advantage of today? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's kind of the, the contain, you know, container Linux versus general purpose Linux choice that's been around for 10 years, right? Since you know, it's over 10 years since CoreOS first came out. Um, so if you're, if you're running standard Kubernetes or container workloads, I would argue you should be doing it on a container optimized Linux because all you need in that distro is the container runtime and a very small set of other tools, and the advantages you get in terms of manageability, uh, updatability at you know at scale. Um, you know, it you don't need the flexibility of a general-purpose OS, so that you know those advantages outweigh 
you know, any, any disadvantages. The, the, the main thing is it's just a different way of operating, right? This is what we see with, um, with users is, you know, they're used to managing a general purpose system where they can, where they SSH in and they change things and, um, you know, it's con configured kind of after boot time with Flatcar, it's like you have a declarative config or, or, or any of the other container operating systems, right? Bottle Rocket, Talos, all of the, right? There's a, there's, a, there's a declarative config and each machine is, you know, you know exactly what's on it. Um, and if you're running at scale, that's, that's what you want. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate ha seeing so many of you here and uh, your attention for the last 40 minutes. And um, yeah, uh, do, do come and uh, come out to the community, join us in any of these groups, and um, see you around. <laughs>